So um, thank you for having me here today. So um, I am the Associate Director of Policy at Carbon 180. And for context, Carbon 180 is a California-based climate NGO. And we are focused entirely on carbon removal. And we work on both natural and technological carbon removal um, solutions. But I'm going to focus a little more on the technology side. And that's for a few reasons. The first is that I think that federal policy, which is where we focus our work, is a little more um, mature on, on technological carbon removal solutions. Um, it's also because that's my background, and I've been at Carbon 180 for about three and a half months, so we're still ramping up our lands work. Um, we do think it's super important, and, and a couple of my colleagues really focus on it. Um, and when we talk about technical removal, and I'll, I'll, you know, we talk about direct air capture and bioenergy with carbon capture as the two kind of primary pathways, but there's a really big tie-in, I think, for policymakers with carbon capture on industrial and power sources. So I think that's for a couple of reasons. The first is that with bioenergy with CCS, you're talking about very similar technologies, right? Carbon capture on a power plant is not totally dissimilar from um, cap carbon capture on a, on a bio um, bioenergy plant. Um, but the other thing is that policymakers don't know a whole lot about carbon removal. And when we're coming in to talk to them about something that they don't really know about and they don't really understand, it's helpful if we start from a place where they have some amount of knowledge. And carbon capture is a place where they have some amount of knowledge. There are also some similar um, needs down the road. So um, infrastructure needs, questions around carbon storage and carbon use, as well as things like CO2 pipelines. Um, and I think additionally, you'll see some of the, um, Natalie mentioned the National Academies of uh, Sciences report, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But some of the places where you'll see R&D for direct air capture and for bioenergy and, and CCS are the places where we're already doing research and development at the federal level for carbon capture on power and industrial um, fronts. So my job is all about figuring out what are the federal policies we need to get uh, carbon removal deployed at scale and how do we get those enacted. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of federal carbon removal policy, some of the immediate needs, and then a few of the questions that I think are really important for us to start answering now as we, um, as we kind of ramp up federal carbon removal policy. So. I'll start with saying there's not a whole lot going on. There's a couple of things. I've got four things here. One of them is not even public yet. It's it's really early stage, so um, it's a fun time. But there's not a lot, uh, not uh, a lot on the books right now. The most important thing I think that we have right now for direct air capture as well as bioenergy with CCS is something called the 45Q tax credit. And 45Q is a reference to the tax code. We'll just move on. It doesn't matter what it means. Um, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, this is a tax credit that's been in place, um, I think, since the 90s, actually. But last year, a bill passed into law almost exactly a year ago to update 45Q. And it did several different things. But the important things for uh, carbon removal were that direct air capture was suddenly eligible for this. So previously, this was something that only um, power uh, carbon capture on power plants was eligible for. Um, carbon use outside of enhanced oil recovery was eligible. So most of the, the kind of carbon dioxide use that you see today is around enhanced oil recovery or EOR. Um, and that was the only um, kind of recognized use for captured CO2 in the, the previous credit. That's now that's now not true. Any other sort of beneficial use is also eligible. And it increased the value, which is obviously um, a pretty big deal when we're talking about, Natalie had the slide, with the cost Direct air capture is really expensive right now, and so now you get $50 a ton for um, CO2 that's captured and then stored underground, and $35 if it's then sent for use. There's another bill out there that has not been enacted, but is um, kind of making its way through Congress. It was introduced last year in the Senate and actually passed out of committee by voice vote, which means that nobody really objected to it that much, which is a pretty big deal. Um, and it was reintroduced this Congress and the House and the Senate. It's a bicameral, very bipartisan bill. And um, it's called the Use It Act. And what it does is establish funding for R&D for direct air capture, a competitive prize for at, at kind of around $35 million. $50 million in R&D funding for carbon use, and then starts to look at some of the um, 
infrastructure needs for wide-scale deployment and uh, of carbon capture and carbon removal. And I think that last point, this part of the bill doesn't have a lot of teeth for a number of reasons. It's a, a politically challenging area when we start talking about things like infrastructure and regulation. But one of the things that I think is really important and that is reflected especially in this, um, in this kind of final piece of the Use It Act is that Historically, Congress has thought about carbon capture policy in a very project-by-project project way. So there's been this idea that you need to do a lot of R&D at the lab scale, do some demos, and maybe fund a few big projects. So we have Petronova in Texas. We, you know, we're going to have a couple of other projects like Kemper and FutureGen, these, these giant carbon capture projects. You build those. You learn a lot by doing, and then the costs come down, and then somehow, magically, you get a bunch of these plants, and that's the, that's the entire role of the federal government. And when we're talking about this, you know, our entire motivation is climate, and when you're talking about it, deploying these technologies for climate, you really need to think about deploying them at a really big scale. So you don't need five or 10 or 15 of these projects. You need hundreds and thousands of them. And to get there, you need infrastructure to enable that level of deployment. And so I think you're starting to see a shift in how Congress thinks about the uh, policy around these technologies and that they're really considering the, the kind of scale of the challenge ahead of them. And something else I'll say about this, if you get really interested in the politics, and I'll talk a minute about this, uh, in a minute about this, but if you get really interested into kind of how pol uh, policymakers at the federal level think and talk about carbon removal. There was a hearing in the Use It Act in the Environment and Public Works Committee last Wednesday. And for this is a bill that um, Senator uh, John Barrasso from Wyoming, a Republican, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, um, a, a climate leader, a Democrat from Rhode Island, introduced together. There are several other members on it as well. But if you watch even the kind of first 15 minutes of this hearing, um, it'll give you a really good insight to how they think about it because I think it's probably very different than how um, folks in the room think about it. Uh, you'll have a lot of feelings about it. Um, <laughs> the third thing that's going on right now is there are efforts to change how the Department of Energy is structured. So Congress, every 10 or 15 years, more or less, gets uh, an itch to update how the Department of Energy works. And in particular, they tend to do this office by office. So most of the carbon capture research and development that happens is in the Office of Fossil Energy. And that's true for um, direct air capture as well. So um, I don't have the slide that I used in this class, but about $11.5 million dollars have, has ever been spent on direct air capture um, from the federal government, from the U.S. federal government, and 1.5 of that was for that NAS report. So not a whole lot of money. Um, but most of it has come through the Office of Fossil Energy. And so there are two bills that would change how um, the Office of Fossil Energy is structured and what their priorities are, which is really important because right now the Office of Fossil Energy is totally focused on coal. And that's both really explicit under this administration, but also kind of ingrained in how um, the researchers at the National Lab think about their job, which I, I think if you really want to meet some, for, for some reason, if you really want to meet somebody who believes that there is a future for coal in America and is their job to provide that future, go to Morgantown, West Virginia, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and just grab a random person, a random scientist in there. Uh, and you've got probably, I'd say, like a, a 8 in 10 chance of getting somebody who will, who will make that case. So we're really excited that Congress is interested in this. And again, they only do it every 10 or 15 years. So we actually are um, pretty lucky on timing because we have the NAS report that came out in October, lays out a really clear path for um, uh, R&D on negative emissions technologies. And now we have a chance to update how the Department of Energy works. The kind of bad news is that uh, there's a bit of variance in the, in the efforts in this. So the House bill. And the Fossil Energy Research and Development Act would establish the first ever carbon removal R&D program. So that $11.5 million I mentioned is kind of one-off pieces of funding in the 3 to $5 million range. Um, we don't have a dedicated carbon removal program at the federal level. We don't have annual funding going to this. That would change this. Now it's funded at $30 million a year, which is better than zero. But the NAS report puts the, the kind of need at 60 to $200 million a year. So this is certainly, and, and I'll say when I was um, in a room recently with some of the NAS report authors, one of the things they mentioned is that when they were deciding what the numbers they would publish would be around kind of the need for, for direct air capture R&D, for example, 
would be there was a conversation about making them as politically feasible as possible. So they put out the 60 to $200 million a year, but there were conversations. It seemed to be a bit of a consensus that, that the real need is something like an order of magnitude larger. So $30 million is good, not, uh, not a, um, you know, kind of not adequate at this point. But then there are other challenges where the Senate bill has no carbon removal program. Both of these are really power sector um, focused. So one of the things Natalie mentioned was the need to do a lot of decarbonization outside of just the power sector. And in something like the industrial sector, carbon capture on these sources, so things like steel and cement production, the only way we know how to get rid of those emissions right now is carbon capture. And you have no federal money going to deploying those technologies to doing the research that's necessary. All of this is really power focused. And right now, again, mostly focused on coal, um, but better than nothing. The last thing that I wanted to mention that's going on right now is um, kind of reflective of a growing interest in carbon removal in Congress. So this is, there's not a huge level of education right now, but when we do talk to members, they get really excited about it. So for example, the caucus, um, this is not public yet, so I'm not gonna mention who the members are, but it's led by Democrats. And one in particular whose idea it was, we got a call out of the blue to come in and talk to them about carbon removal. We never talked to this office. It wasn't um, kind of one of our top targets. You know, we didn't think that they might be we didn't think they'd be particularly interested in this. And they came in and said, you know, what is going on? What is carbon removal? We're hearing all about it and in these discussions around climate. And so we gave them our spiel and, you know, this is what it is and, and here's why it's important for climate and this is what carbon capture is. In that meeting, they were like, is there a caucus on this? Can we do something? And for clarity, the caucuses are, can, they're just like groups of members who get together and they're like, we have the same set of priorities. There are caucuses on lots of different things. Um, but this is one where they want to do a bunch of legislation. And so they went from not really knowing what this is to being really excited about it and wanting to do a whole bunch of things on it. Um, and I can't share, they're kind of working out the, the specifics on what the mission of this will be. But what you'll see is it'll reflect um, how members of Congress think about this. So not just as this kind of um, siloed carbon removal as its own thing um, kind of issue, but it'll also be tied into larger questions on how to deploy carbon capture for climate. So beyond what's going on now, the, the kind of couple of bills that are out, there are several other immediate needs for, for um, federal policy and carbon removal. And these aren't exhaustive, but I think um, will give you a pretty good sense of what's going on. And I, the, the things I'll talk about here, the R&D program, deployment incentives, infrastructure, and the land side, some of these reflect kind of what we think is important and, and, and parts of it will reflect kind of what's the conversation in DC, uh, you know, around the needs, so especially on things like infrastructure. So on the rd and program, some of the things that we need beyond just the bills that we're talking about that would establish a kind of low level funding for carbon removal, um, right, a dedicated carbon removal program. We can't just have this in the Office of Fossil Energy. We need to bring in other pieces of the Department of Energy um, a big part of the reason we've seen a drop in cost for, um, I mean, one of the many reasons we've seen a drop in the cost for wind and solar is because the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy is really good at what they do. They're really goal focused. They um, have a better track record, to be honest, than the Office of Fossil Energy and these technologies. Um, and when we're talking about direct air capture, and especially when we're talking about bioenergy with CCS, there are lots of questions that the Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy isn't equipped to ask about the implications. I mean, we, we don't have to get into all the questions around BECS right now, but there are so many challenges around that, and people who have expertise in bioenergy are really important. Closer, we need a higher level of funding. Um, that's really hard. So again, this was a 60 to $200 million a year recommendation. Um, for context, all of the, the, the entire carbon capture program each year gets about $100 million a year. So we're talking about a really big boost in funding. We also need more support for carbon use and carbon storage. So about $100 million a year gets spent on um, carbon storage and carbon use. About 10 million of that is carbon use, 10 to 12 million. So pretty substantial, but um, I think this is a question that often, or this part of the discussion often gets left behind. What do you do with the CO2 when you capture it? And I think the, you know, I think there's a pretty broad agreement that the vast majority of this is going to need to be stored geologically underground. And 
Um, we've done a little bit of that. I think there's something like we were discussing the number last night. I think something like 15 million um, tons of CO2 have been sequestered um, successfully underground. We monitor those. We do a lot of research on it. That's not nearly the scale that we're talking about long term for climate. And so more research and development, more monitoring, more experience doing those sorts of things is also really important for carbon removal. We're also going to need deployment incentives. So direct air capture is expensive and it's not producing power. Um, it just costs money to run it. And so we're going to have to find ways to make up that cost gap. Some of those things can be tax incentives like the 45Q tax incentive, extending that, expanding it increasing the value, other types of incentives. The same with financing structures. I, and I will say, you're going to hear me go through those really quickly because I think this is a bit of a gap in um, policy development for carbon removal and for carbon capture. It's interesting to see when we're thinking about the bills and policies that we're going to go and, and, and advocate for and outline for our policymakers. You'll see different types of people with different backgrounds in there, but I think one big... Um, very obvious gap for us is um, experts on, on kind of financing, um, and I think that that's something that, that we're thinking about how to address. Um, there's a federal loan guarantee program um, that direct air capture could be eligible for. There's about $8 billion sitting there in a loan guarantee um, authorization, so could provide some support. And then um, the other, you know, the kind of final bullet here is on carbon tech markets. So carbon tech is what we use, that's the term we use to talk about carbon use or taking CO2 and turning it into commercial products like building materials and fuels and carbon fiber and, you know, tennis shoes and those sorts of things. Um, and right now um, we're seeing a really big increase in this market. So this is um, a map. I'm realizing the colors aren't super helpful. There's just a lot of dots. That's the important thing. Um, there are a lot of there are kind of 80 plus um, carbon use projects in the U.S. today, and that's a really big increase that's happened very recently. And I think it's also important to think about when we're talking about passing policy on these things to look at where these are. So these aren't necessarily traditional fossil states, who are the ones who've been most engaged in things like the Office of Fossil Energy or advocacy around carbon capture. California actually has more carbon use projects than any other state, but you see them in the Carolinas and Georgia, um, kind of in the um, uh, kind of industrial Midwest. You see um, a really big geographic diversity, which I think cannot be underestimated, the, the, the importance of this, because right now the, you know, things like the Office of Fossil Energy, the fact that they're coal focused really reflect the people who care about, you know, the, the priorities of the people who really spend their time in Congress advocating for it. And you don't have members like Senator Whitehouse or Tom Udall on appropriations caring a lot about how much money goes to the Office of Fossil Energy and what it's structured like. You have members from coal states like West Virginia and Wyoming really dictating that. And so we need to start to bring in more champions from more places who have priorities that are more climate focused if we're going to get any sort of serious uh, carbon removal policy. Um, and we did just um, shout out to, to my colleagues, Mount Lucas and Roy Jacobson did a um, a study on the total available market for carbon tech because there are kind of ongoing discussions about how much of the CO2 that we capture can be used um, rather than just stored, which is, again, a big question around being able to deploy um, uh, direct air capture and other carbon removal, um, technological carbon removal options. And they found that this is a global number that's close to $6 trillion of a total available market. In the U.S. alone, that's a, there's a $1 trillion um, total available market. And there's a full report um, that you can access on our, on our website if you're interested. Um, there are a lot of infrastructure questions. So I mentioned the Use It Act starts to get at these and that it's a really important shift for Congress. But it's also a really hard one. Regulatory changes around how we monitor um, geologic storage, things like pipelines. What role does the federal government have in regulating CO2, the construction of CO2 pipelines, especially across states? Do they have a role in financing these pipelines? Are there ways to use existing infrastructure on CO2 pipelines? There are discussions over, you know, oversizing. If you're going to build a pipeline, why not build it at 36 inches and slide a 12-inch uh, uh, in diameter uh, CO2 pipeline through that. Um, and then some of the other kind of questions around siting. So um, Jen Wilcox, who is one of the authors on the National Academies study, 
on negative emissions technologies is also working on a study around um, direct air capture siting. I think a lot of times we think of direct air capture as um, something you can just kind of plop down anywhere, which is closer to true than something um, than, than for something like a carbon capture power plant, um, but isn't totally true. And I also think um, this kind of came up, you um, mentioned a little bit on the storage question. I think there's um, ongoing debates about how, um, how much we know about geologic storage of carbon dioxide, because that's something that we're going to rely on for these um, carbon removal, uh, technological carbon removal and carbon capture solutions, is storing a lot of that CO2 underground. Um, and I'm going to caveat this with I'm, I'm absolutely not a geologist, so I'm going to say a bunch of words the wrong way. But, um, you know, I think questions about induced seismicity and whether whether those are, you know, I, I've heard different things, I'll say. I mean, I work on this a lot, and I'm not sure what the answers are, where have we studied it enough? Some geologists have raised questions. I will say other folks that I work with, people at the Clean Air Task Force, will say that's not a problem at all. We're very sure about how to do this, and I have no idea which is which is right. Uh, but that's a problem, right? Like, I should know. I do this. This is my entire job, and I'm not really sure of it. And so these are definitely going to be questions that policymakers have. The same with um, making sure that the CO2, once it's stays, um, stored underground, stays underground and doesn't start leaking because it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, and then finally on land policy development, um, so we're going to be spending, I know this, for us, the second half of this year doing a lot of land policy development, but I think uh, there are a lot of very basic questions that we have to answer, and we've been working with organizations like the World Resources Institute, who's thought about this for a long time, um, but I think it's something where there's a huge opportunity to do some very easy, low-hanging kind of policy actions that can incentivize a lot of these things. We're already hearing a lot of interest from policymakers. And I think we have the opportunity to think about um, how to do this in the right way. Um, so more on that soon. I'm going to talk, oh, well, I did a bad slide design. Um, but uh, a little bit about, very quickly, just about the politics on this. So most of, all of those carbon removal bills or bills that include carbon removal that I mentioned are really, really bipartisan. And by really bipartisan, I mean um, the Use It Act has Jim Inhofe, who once wrote about uh, the greatest hoax of our time, climate change, and uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who spends uh, one afternoon every single week for the past 100 plus weeks on the Senate floor talking about the urgency of climate change. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that they've been able to kind of, um, I, th I think it's two reasons. One is that they've been able to project their own kind of priorities and values onto this. So if you're Senator Barrasso, and if you if you go watch the EPW hearing remarks, you'll see him talk about this. Um, direct air capture provides a few opportunities for your state. It's potentially a way to produce more oil through enhanced oil recovery. Um, it also, in a less uh, slightly less terrifying um, front, is also an economic opportunity for your state. When you're moving away from coal, their, their former governor um, would say that the, I'm sorry, the Wyoming former governor was a, a, a Republican would say that he wasn't sure if climate change is real, you know, he's not going to, it doesn't matter, but it, it's irrelevant because we're moving towards that way. The economy is moving in a kind of low carbon direction and Wyoming needs to, to kind of carve out some sort of future for themselves. And so Wyoming started to take a lead on a lot of these things where they have the integrated test center, which hosts half of the carbon X prize teams, which are looking at turning CO2 into valuable products. They work with their, uh, their um, infrastructure um, council there to figure out kind of what are the infrastructure needs for carbon capture and carbon removal. And so Senator um, Barrasso is able to support it for those reasons. And Senator Whitehouse will come in and say, this is helpful. This is nice, you know, I look at those same climate reports, and this is, you know, really important for us. It's not a silver bullet. We need to be worried about the, the potential for enhanced oil recovery and continued unabated use of fossil fuels, and we need it with a whole bunch of other different things. And so I think that that's, to, you know, that, that piece of it will continue. I think the other reason that this has been kind of really bipartisan and politically um, palatable for a lot of members um, is that we haven't gotten to the hard stuff yet. A lot of it's around R&D. Um, everybody, mostly, more or less, likes R&D. Even the members who don't like federal government spending are fine with spending a little bit of money on it. Um, you know, I mentioned in the Use It Act, they've got that regulatory piece. 
doesn't really have a lot of teeth. It's already getting people riled up. It doesn't actually, you know, a lot of it's just studies. People are already have a lot of feelings about it. Um, and if you watch that EPW hearing on the Use It Act, you'll hear a lot of members like really um, uh, try to, to calm people down about the potential for Clean Air Act changes or anything around NEPA or anything around, you know, environmental impact studies. And so I think as we get into the more challenging things that are not just questions of like little tweaks to a tax credit, which to be clear, that 45Q thing took like seven years and like thousands and thousands of hours. Um, but when you get past just tweaks to existing credits or R&D funding or maybe putting a little money for carbon removal um, at the Department of Energy, you're going to start to see, I think, some fracturing on that, on that front. But for now, everyone's really happy. Everyone loves carbon removal, guys. Um, so I think there are a few key questions that we really need to consider. Um, and some of that gets at the potential for political fracturing, I think, as well as some of the issues that have been raised um, more recently, I think, in, in, in earnest um, by uh, some of the climate justice movements. So the first is on innovation versus regulation. So John Barrasso, Senator of Wyoming, um, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times at the end of last year called um, Cut Carbon Through Innovation, Not Regulation. And this is where he argued against a carbon tax and instead that R&D would save us. So I think there's been a change in how um, conservatives in Congress and Republicans in Congress talk about climate change. So obviously members like Senator, White, or Senator Inhofe are famous for you know, he once brought a snowball onto the Senate floor to prove that climate change was, in fact, a hoax. Um, and then when you started to look at um, around 2015, that started to change. So there was an amendment to, I want to say it was the Keystone Pipeline Bill. We're going to ignore that part. But, um, and Senator White House introduced an amendment, and it said climate change is real and not a hoax. An obvious dig at Enhoff. Enhoff still voted for it. 99 out of 100 senators voted for it. Roger Wicker was the one we, no one knows why. Um, he voted against it. Um, and so you saw this shift, but then there was another amendment that said climate change is real, it's not a hoax, and it's caused by humans. And then you saw a huge drop off of Republicans. And now, in 20, end of 2018, 2019, I think what you see is um, Senator Brasso kind of at the forefront of where um, we might see conservatives go on this which is that climate change is real, it's caused by humans, but the solution is innovation. It's not a carbon tax, it's not Clean Air Act regulations, it's not clean power plan, it's not caps, it's uh, more R&D funding. And I think that um, we certainly think that's not sufficient, um, and I think that there's kind of some consensus probably in this room or amongst the people who think about it that that's probably not sufficient. But I do think um, it's something that um, in this particular op-ed, he calls out direct air, like there's a paragraph on just direct air capture. So this is something that we, I think as carbon removal advocates are going to be at the center of and have to figure out how to navigate. So that's something that we're going to have to really, um, you know, think about very clearly because Senator Barrasso, to be honest, has been one of the biggest champions for carbon removal, for direct air capture and has supported a lot of this, has, has enabled a lot of these bills to pass. That's why he was a big part of why the 45Q tax credit um, was updated. He's a big part of the reason that the Use It Act is moving. Um, and so I think that's going to be something we have to grapple with sooner rather than later. Next thing is just fossil fuels broadly. So I think here, um, what's the role of direct air capture and enhanced oil recovery? How do we navigate um, regulations around enhanced oil recovery? How do we navigate, you know, these technologies potentially being used for enhanced oil recovery? Carbon engineering was um, recently received, I think it was a 20 million, this is a um, direct air capture company that has had, um, is kind of the furthest along in, the, in North America. And uh, they received, I think it was $20 million in investment from Occidental Petroleum and Chevron. And maybe there are lots of reasons they might have done that. One um, might be for the potential for enhanced oil recovery. Um, and I think this is also something, you know, um, Will and I had a good conversation over dinner about moral hazard last night. Um, but I think the question of um, allowing, I, I think this is very overcomable, but the question of does um, carbon removal and does direct air capture allow us to kind of put off mitigation um, for longer? We don't want that, to be clear. Um, I think environmental justice, this is something 
um, that I think has been missing from the conversation around carbon removal and carbon capture in, um, in DC circles for a long time. And I think that not only is there a very clear moral reason that we should start thinking about these things, but um, I, I think we can't ignore them, right? Like, no, pol we're, we're not going to see policy success if we don't take these questions seriously. And um, as an anecdote, so there were um, the 45Q tax credit, there was this bill to update it, the PASS was signed into law, very bipartisan. And we saw um, attacks from kind of two places on this bill from, from the left. We also saw them on the right. But um, one was this kind of debate over 100% renewables versus 100% clean energy. And um, I'm happy to talk about this in more detail, but those didn't, those kind of fell flat. I think um, a lot of the members who really care about climate read the same studies we do, know that we kind of really need to throw everything at, uh, at climate and, and they're not gonna rule out advanced nuclear or um, you know carbon capture on natural gas or those sorts of things, while also really strenuously supporting renewables. Um, but one thing that the, the other attack that we got was around um, questions on water impacts in communities where there's enhanced oil recovery and if 45Q, updating 45Q, increasing the value, would enable more enhanced oil recovery and what that would do to local communities. And that, and not the 100% clean, argument was what actually peeled off a couple of members from continuing to support carbon capture and carbon removal. And we saw that be way more effective. So in addition to the fact that it's just frankly like moral of us to think about these issues, and I know they're really important to us at Carbon 180, um, from a pure um, strategic standpoint, we really need to start thinking about that. I'm going to use the same picture to talk about just transition because as somebody who grew up in southern West Virginia um, near, uh, you know, coal communities, this is something that has always been a part of carbon capture and more recently carbon removal advocacy, but I don't think that the community's necessarily taken it very seriously. We've been able to say, you know, um, carbon capture is gonna allow a transition for coal jobs and coal communities and coal miners, and that's not true. Um, not in, and not in um, the kind of policy levers that we've, that we've um, focused on to date. And um, I think that what, one of the many great things that the Green New Deal advocates and, and AOC have done is to to bring some, to make people get serious about this question. I think they brought it as, um, you know, a really key part of their climate strategy. And I think that there is a huge opportunity for carbon removal advocates to think about how we can help those communities transition in a, um, to kind of low and no carbon um, you know, jobs and economies that pay really well and, you know, are union jobs and, and have pensions and those sorts of things. But it's something that I think that to date we haven't really taken seriously. We've just kind of had a talking point about this providing a, a ramp for coal communities when that's not entirely true. Um, and I just want to wrap up by saying, I think um, I talked to Nada's class and I walked away and I was worried that I was a little too pessimistic about um, what was going on in Congress and what our chances were of getting something done on this. But I just wanted to say two, two, kind of op two notes of optimism. One is I think because of the Green New Deal and because of other efforts like this, everybody in D.C. is talking about climate. And that was not true 8, 10, 12 months ago. And it hasn't been true for a while. This was, it was hard to get people to really care about this. And now you know, we would struggle to think, okay, how for 2020 candidates are we going to get them to care about climate change first and then talk about, you know, our technologies or think about our technologies? They're all going to have, car you know, they're going to have very detailed climate platforms. Every member has to take a stance on this. You know, I think that's part of the reason you see op-eds like Senator Barrasso's and you're seeing Republicans take climate change seriously in these hearings, hearings where they used to just bring climate scientists in to, you know, essentially throw rotten fruit at them. They're asking them really um, legitimate, you know, they're asking them some legitimate <laughs> questions and, and really engaging on this. And I think specifically with carbon removal, right now we have an opportunity not just to kind of make progress today, not just waiting for a new administration that takes climate change seriously. We have opportunity to make climate progress today, and we have the opportunity, it's a blank slate, we have the opportunity to do it right, take into account things like environmental justice and just transition. And so I think it's a really fun time to work on this.